Kapan? Dun, dun, dun. Oh, you're alive. And there we are. Okay, let me just see the audio. Actually, I think we're good. Quick, can you do a little test one, too? Just a little voice test. Actually, Demaria, your screen might be frozen. Oh, wait, no, there you are. There we go. Okay, we're good. Um, and we have a few viewers in the lobby, so I can. And I'll get going with just the intro. Um, okay, sounds good. Yeah. Uh, well, welcome everyone, and thanks for being with us. Uh, we are here with Samantha Norman, executive editor of the Tulsa Star, and Demaria Monday of Block Builders. Uh, this is Transformative Justice, Addressing Harm and Accountability in the Community. Um, and before we get to that, I just want to plug a couple of our upcoming events for at OKNO.1, OK, one, OK number one. Um, the first is at the end of the month on Sunday, August 30th at 9 p.m. It's Sex Lives of Dates, a breakup in three acts with Paul Pescador. And he was an artist we had planned Jurassic Park the musical. He was going to come to Tulsa, and that was scheduled right as COVID hit. And so, um, you know, we were in, is it safe to fly? And ended up canceling that. And then um, the other is called Obedient X3 with artist Zach Blass, and that's Sunday, September 13th at 1 p.m. because he's in London and um, is time change. And um, Zach is an amazing artist and also huge inspiration for LA Crypto Party, his writing. And so we're going to do a little, some kind of teaser talks talking uh, ahead of this event. But that's all I have to say. And yeah, so very excited to have Tamantha and Demaria. And I'm going to drop out and hand it over to them. Thank you very much. Awesome. And thank you, Blue Goose, for hosting us once again. I appreciate it and everything you're doing over at LP1. So, yeah, so today basically um, I wanted to be in conversation with the fellow community. I mean, I, would, I don't refer to myself as an activist, I feel like that's like a term that needs to be given to you. but. You know, this woman is the real deal um, in the community. So I really wanted to be in conversation with someone who has um, been doing the work for years. Um, also someone who has uh, been impacted by some of the destructive societal systems, um, been on the inside and known what that is like. So her insight is so incredibly important to me um, when it comes to transformative justice and uh, the need for that, you know, not just locally, but you know, regionally and nationally and globally, really. Um, so before we get into the nuts and bolts of transformative justice, what it is, unpacking it, um, what taking this theory looks like, you know, on the actual streets and into the communities, um, I want to get your thoughts on a quote that I came across recently. Um, I actually don't know who wrote it, but I think it's just one of the activists that I follow on Instagram. Um, they said, relationships are activism too. Relationships are activism too. So, Demari, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. What does that What does that quote mean to you? Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. And relationships are activism too. I can definitely see that because relationships are so important in doing this work that we do. Um, it's important to be able to have you know that relational value. Therefore, that you know that you can depend on. We can depend on one another. And then we're able to speak to each other as, as resources because different people have different different skill sets, different talents, and different and different access to resources. So, um, but when we build our relationships, and we're able to tap into each other as a resource. So that's what I get from that quote. Yeah, I love that. Um, for me, when I saw that, I was like, I mean, it sounds like a no-brainer, right? But for me, it was like, it wasn't necessarily. It kind of, you know. 
sets some things off in my mind because I feel like so much, because there's so much going on and the urgency of it all, we're doing all this work on behalf of the people, but forgetting about the people and the process, you know what I mean? Or forgetting about like, you know, our one-on-one interpersonal relationships and how, you know, even a lot of my favorite activists from back in the day um, had some problematic, you know, personal relationships. And again, that doesn't take away from the work that they did, but, you know, if you have a certain image in front of, you know, the whole society, but then the folks that are closest to you don't get the best version of you, then, you know, what is your activism really good for? You know what I mean? If you're not, you know, yeah. you know, taking it, taking in the whole of it, you know, internally and externally, you know what I mean? I know what you mean. And I think sometimes because, you know, people get caught up on, on, on the image and mm. so it's hard to be who you are behind closed doors and, you know, it, it, yeah. without being judged more harshly by society. Yeah. But I think with that as activists, it's, it's really hard to find balance in, with that. So therefore, if, if we're not taking care of ourselves properly, then we become imbalanced. And when we become imbalanced, then we start to, we start to lash out and we start to, you know, just act out of frustration and our, and our personal relationships suffer as a result. And so I, I definitely believe that, um, you know, self-care is, is, is highly important. You know, we give so much of ourselves. And so therefore, when we're giving so much of ourselves, it's important to take a step back to understand that we've got to take care of ourselves first and foremost, before we can take care of anybody else. And as we're taking care of ourselves and, and, we, and we're more in balance and in tune with ourselves, then our relationships will flourish as a result, our interpersonal, interpersonal relationships. No, I totally agree. I totally agree. I was going to go a little further with that, but I won't. <laughs> I mean, I want to, I want to, I want to get into, I want to like just ex- talk, like set the framework for what transformative justice is, because I feel like, um, and then I, then we're gonna dive into all of that. But um, I feel like I, I've heard re- restorative justice. I kind of want to like talk about the differences a little bit between transformative justice and restorative justice, um, and kind of set the framework, and then we can like start out big and then kind of peter down. Um, so I know a lot of people are probably, you know, used to tr- restorative justice. That term um, is something that I kind of heard a little bit of when I, you know, used to be a teacher. But um, as I was saying with one of my goals with this talk, as far as taking the abstract and making it practical, I felt like a lot of times when we get, you know, these lofty ideas, but there's not a clear uh, strategy around implementation then sometimes the true meaning of the framework gets lost and becomes something completely different. Like for instance, with community policing in Tulsa, when I see how community policing in Tulsa, <laughs> um, what, <laughs> that was too funny. Um, what it is, I'm just like, this is not what I know it to be, but it's just like when we don't have folks in place that may be educated on it and willing to do the work on it and others and provide an alternative, alternative and we let other folks who maybe have a stake in people being miseducated on it so they can mold it into what they want it to be, then, you know, that's recipe for disaster. And, you know, it, it, it causes people to look at said framework in a negative way because it isn't being implemented correctly or being interpreted correctly. So as far as restorative justice, basically it's just a framework for um, improving relationships um, between people and within communities. So um, in schools, there's some schools where, you know, if there's a student that uh, is having a lot of disciplinary issues, um, instead of doing, you know, a lot of the punitive disciplinary things that a lot of schools do, like the in-house suspension or doing suspensions or isolating the student where they're not getting the education they're supposed to be there for, um, they bring together like a uh, a counselor, they bring the parents in there, um, a trusted staff member, like they have like a, a circle and they, they plan ways to like, you know, I guess in a more holistic way to help the student out instead of like, you know, continuing on with the whole punishment model. Um, but I guess the issue or the limitation, I would say the issue, restorative justice is still a great framework and it actually fits right in with transformative justice. It's not like an either or thing. They both work in tandem. But the thing with restorative justice is, and I've heard multiple um, seasoned local community activists say this, when people harp on restorative justice, it's like, what are we restoring ourselves to? Like when we talk about criminal justice reform, that's all well and good, but if you're just making incremental changes to a system that is functioning the way it was designed to, then where is that really getting us? You know, we're taking 
two steps forward and then taking 10 steps back, you know, it's just kind of this thing where it's like, I think restorative justice and criminal justice reform are good steps on the path to liberation, but they are not the end all be all. Um, if that makes sense. So as far as restorative justice, it goes hand in hand with transformative justice, but what transformative justice is trying to do is trying to go the next step further um, by making sure that as far as a society, we are starting to transition to responding to harm and violence and abuse without using the state. So when I say the state, what do I mean? I mean like not involving police for everything, not using incarceration, isolating people if they have mental health issues and just throwing them away in a sanitarium or you know a psychiatric facility for the rest of their lives. Um, not using ICE over you know immigration issues. That's just just you know, you know that should be something that should be something that is a criminal offense. Um, and then also trying to actually like have solutions that are not going to reinforce and perpetuate violence, which is another issue with the current systems we have in place, you know, where you have someone who has done something violent, but it's like, so is our answer to then throw them in a more violent environment and then they're gonna come back out into the world? You know, having been in this even more violent environment, you know, it's just, it, it all doesn't make sense. The it's cycle, just all very- cycle continues. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And then also making sure that like, we're trying to prevent violence. That's also another part of transformative justice. So it's like, we're trying to make sure that we're not involving the state. We're tr trying to seek interventions that are giving the community agency. Um, we, we're not trying to further perpetuate violence. And we're trying to make sure that real accountability is taking place. Because honestly, when you think about like someone who ends up being incarcerated, is the harm that they've done actually been addressed? You know what I mean? Like, for instance, mm -hmm. if someone ends up doing like a 20 year sentence for robbery. There's no rehabilitation in that. Exactly. Yeah. And has the original harm been addressed? Like, you know, mm -hmm. I would just want the item back that you stole. I, I personally wouldn't want somebody to go into a violent institution for 20 years because you stole my car, you know. And, and you but, come out you know, worse. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, but also that goes back to like, you know, wanting to see the transformative power in people and not want to throw people away you know what i mean so yeah um yeah so I wanna, um, um not to cut you off but before, no, no, we, go, before we go too deeper into it yeah. i want to i want to take a step back and 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 go back to restorative justice um yes. because i was trying to gain an understanding of the difference of the two also and yes. so in in my in my journey of, of trying to gain a deeper understanding what i came to learn about restorative justice is based on it it is um it is if you look at it from a historical standpoint it's it's based on the culture of indigenous people so whether mm -hmm. that whether it's indigenous whether it's you know our, our native americans or also the um the yoruba tribe the, there's a search you know this the the practice of having peace circles and in these circles where we you know where you uplift the person who has done the harm and so yeah. instead of so instead of saying like you know criminalizing or punishing that person, you're trying to get them back to the, you're trying to reinstate them to a better version of themselves. So um, I saw an interview one time that took place by, with a man that was incarcerated for for quite an extended amount of time, but it was an in depth conversation between him and his mother, where mm -hmm. his mother was able to express the harm that was done by you know by him his actions that caused him to leave. Um, restorative justice is also used in concept because what it does is it gives the the perpetrator an a, a opportunity or the victim an opportunity to for them to come together and to say that instead of instead of criminalizing and punishing this act how can we repair the harm from this act and so whether that's working through feelings whether that's you know having some type of um some type of repercussions but it, it you know it 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 focuses on repairing the harm and then that that leads us into transformative justice yes where we're talking about repairing the harm because you know with um the the concept of transformative justice from my understanding is that those who are harmed the most are the ones who have the opportunities to elevate their voices to bring a solution to the table yes. so therefore when, you, when we're bringing a solution to the table is somebody who has lived experience that can that can actually be able to relate to and give people an in-depth an in-depth understanding of the the root problem um, and so as we talk about transformative justice, I think I would be amiss not to get, share some of my personal story and, and sure. how, mm -hmm. how I approach this work or why I approach this work the way I do. Me, mm -hmm. myself, I am formally incarcerated. For those of you who don't know, I was sentenced to a mandatory minimum of 10 years 
for a nonviolent drug offense. And at that time, I was I was sentenced away. I, my child was six months old and I was sent thousands of miles away to go and serve my sentence. And so, um, but while I was there, you know, I had plenty of time for reflection. And I knew that I did not want to be the same person that I was when I came home. So, um, but I, I had a chance to think about the actual harm that I had done to the community, not to my immediate people of, you know, who I sold drugs to, but on a bigger, on a larger scale about the generation behind me and mm -hmm. seeing like, you know, how do I influence their actions in a negative way? And then, so that right there caused me to, you know, I, it, it really made me pause and think and, and say that I want to be the change. I really want to be the change that I want to see. And so, you know, coming home, doing all that I can to focus on, on being the person that I wanted to be, you know, I came home and focused on my education. Um, and, it, and at first I wasn't even, I came to Tulsa from a new, a, to a totally different place. And I didn't really plan on sharing my story, to be, to be honest. Like I was coming up here to start, you know, just start, start over. Nobody knew me and I, you know, was able to build a life fresh. However, I guess God had bigger plans for me and my story. And, and so um, I encountered somebody else that me and him, we went to school together for an entire semester and we did not even know that we had similar backgrounds. And once we learned that we had similar backgrounds and that encouraged me and inspired to share my story because so many times people who have been to prison are often stigmatized. You know, there's this stigma put on us and there's, you know, there's so many different barriers. So, you know, if you can, you know, if you could avoid that then who wouldn't want to avoid it? Sure. But, you know, but however, I realized it was important for me to share my story in order to be able to help other people understand and also to start to start destigmatizing justice involvement. You know, that I'm not defined by my past, that my past doesn't determine my future. And so with that, though, um, one of the biggest things that I realized is that policy is what is what really has crippled our community. And that mm -hmm. if we really want to, to create a lasting change and something that's meaningful, and, and if we want to dismantle the systems that have oppressed our communities, then it's very important for us to go to the same systems that created the damage. And we go and we rewrite the policies that have created harm. And so with that, that leads me to the legislation that I worked on. I was very uh, instrumental in passing HB, House Bill 3393. And what that is, is Oklahoma's anti-shackling legislation, women who are incarcerated, pregnant women in, who are incarcerated often give birth with their with their wrist handcuffed to the bed or their ankle handcuffed to the bed and most people don't even know that you know like that is so that's so, so barbaric that you wouldn't think that that's even happening so you know i had to raise awareness of, of the situation first and then from there you know i told my state representative representative regina goodwin and from there she's like no damari that's not happening and I started, started introducing her to multiple different people who that was their story also. So then therefore we were able to shift the power of the people who had been harmed because these, these women who were, you know, like DOC was denying that it even was even taking place. But then when you meet, when you meet people who, who have been incarcerated, who have been handcuffed while delivering their baby over a time span of 20 years, you can't deny that. And so there was power in those women's voices and power in their stories. Me, myself, I was not, I was not incarcerated when I had my baby. However, you know, I saw women who came back from prison who they had had their baby just a day or two before and they had to return back to prison without their baby. Mm -hmm. Some women returned back not knowing where their baby was. If, you know, if somebody, if their family member was going to gonna come get the baby or if the baby was going to stay, you know, it, some people had that. So with me, it was really important to, to, you know, what can we do to end the shackling of pregnant women, to keep mothers together? And not only that, but to keep women from being traumatized even more. Because the bill, the bill prohibits shackling of incarcerated pregnant women, but it goes a step farther and allows women to have somebody in the room with them for support. It doesn't have to be their husband. It could be any, a loved one. It could be their mother, their cousin, you know, just somebody. It could also be clergy. It could be, um, you know, it's just we try to, to cover all cult, cultural backgrounds to be inclusive of everybody's experience. And, and most importantly, you know, it, it also gives, it gives room for a woman not to have a male guard standing in between her legs waiting that's a stranger that's waiting for this baby to come out so the biggest thing of it to me is restoring dignity and to incarcerated women yes and yeah so that's, and this is, that's, and that's a big just that's just a small piece of work and yeah. doing some of the work but that like that that what you said there are two pieces i want to kind of piggyback off of dignity right yes dignity and agency that's that's those are major pieces of transformative justice because as it stands right now when you talk about 
the systems that we have in place that are supposed to be protecting us and helping us with harm. There's no dignity in that. There's no agency in that. Um, even in our own relate our own relationships, when you think about like some neighborhoods where it's like they're policing and surveilling each other, like, oh, you didn't cut the grass, or there's a suspicious young man selling candy in my neighborhood. Why do we feel the need in society to police people and, and to surveil people? You know, it even this kind of this kind of thinking even seeps into our, you know, interpersonal relationships with people and keeps us isolated from one another when we should be coming together. Um, so yeah, that's just want to make that point. Um, and then the trauma, um, trauma, trauma, trauma. So trauma is is definitely something that is an important part of transformative justice as well. Um, so as far as the trifecta of the what I consider trifecta when it comes to transformative change, you know, we talk about restorative justice and then transformative justice, which is, you know, restorative justice is underneath that. But another piece of this is healing justice, which is where we're trying to deal with this generational trauma that has happened to us um, by doing practices that are going to help our bodies and our minds and our spirits. So, you know, whether that's therapy, um, being with loved ones, yoga, whatever that may be. And I feel like, again, because there's just so much happening externally, I mean, we're fighting white supremacy, we're fighting all these different but like to be, you know, truly, um, sustainable in this fight at some point, like you said, self-care, community care, collective care, you know, that has to be prioritized, you know, we can walk and chew gum at the same time, you know what I mean? We can still fight against them, but still, you know, take care of ourselves because, you know, if we're running on fumes, that's not a recipe for a success, you know what I mean? In our fight for, you know, liberating folks, you know what I'm saying? So, um, I guess I wanted to hear your thoughts on, you know, do you feel like there are things happening locally in Tulsa that are, you know, you have, you're hopeful about that, you know, could be going in this direction? Um, and what are things that could be happening um, in the short term to get us in this direction where we're not, you know, relying on the state and relying on, on incarceration and actually you're trying to build community? Yes. Um, so with that, I would say that Oklahoma, being where we are, um, we're not quite in the South, not quite in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so we're kind of isolated to a lot of the progression that's, that's taking place in other places. And so when we talk about transformative justice in our community, um, at the moment, I cannot really say that I see multiple different agencies practicing transformative justice. Um, me as an individual or also as an organization with block builders, one thing that, that we do to, to be able to, to address the generational trauma is focus on the at-risk youth. Mm -hmm. Because if you have, you know, I have children around me who I see them that are on their pathway to, to prison. And, and so with that, like by me, I already have, I've already experienced the system. And so therefore I know, you know, the, the things and the causes of what leads you there. So I share my story with them, but not only do I share my story, but I also work with them on reading because um, I don't know if, if most people know, but a lot of times the prison beds are determined, the amount of prison beds are determined by third grade reading, reading levels. So if I have children around me who are not reading on at the grade level that they're supposed to be on, then I would, you know, I take it as my responsibility to help them get to where they're supposed to be. To help them understand that they don't just have to become another statistic. Um, because a lot of times I know with me, myself, you know, I, the dreams that I had of being a veterinarian when I was a child, that those dreams kind of, they were, they faded away. The more I saw, the, the more criminal activity that I saw in my neighborhood, that that was the norm. That was the normal way of survival. And so, um, it's, you know, there's, there, I'm hopeful that more people are, that these conversations are taking place. First of all, where you have people who want to know more about transformative justice. What is transformative justice? And how, how do we bring transformative justice to our community? Yeah. And so, yeah. you, you know, each one of us have a, we have a responsibility. And, it, and, and if we work together and build our relationship, you know, my thing is, is if each one can reach, if each one can teach one, then we can reach one. And that's, you know, that's, that's so true. It can apply in transformative justice also. For sure, for sure. I totally agree, I totally agree. Um, so talking about the practicalities of it, I love that you transitioned to that part. Um, for me, I think once you explain what transformative justice is to most people, they get it. I think though, 
for some reason, I want to get your thoughts on this. Um, it goes back to people, you know, still having this mindset that, you know, we need to police each other. There's, you know, there's no room for redemption, like you said. Um, and also, I would say there's still this thought that, like, even when it comes to, you know, I've seen a lot of people talk about defund the police that was coming up a lot a couple months ago and talking about increasing funding for mental health services and things like that. But in my opinion, when you're saying like, okay, let's just give more funding to these systems and apparatuses. Okay, well, hold on a second. <laughs> Even the foster care system, you know, has some issues. It does mimic the prison system, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, social workers, they definitely pattern a lot of their surveilling of families to the, the criminal justice system, the so-called criminal justice system, yeah. I say criminal legal system. And so it's just like- black and brown people. Yeah. Exactly. So it's just like when we keep on like, okay, we're saying these systems are problem, but then all of our solutions that everyone is giving us, our leaders and, and, and such, are just like, let's give more money to these systems. <laughs> they have not helped us thus far. So like what I'm saying is like, we've got to have some political imagination and expand beyond that. And like, no, what can we do amongst ourselves? You know, like there's, I know in Chicago and Philadelphia and some other cities, they have like a violence uh, interrupter programs where they have like respected community members go and help like mediate and handle disputes between other community members or you know where maybe there are free therapy um sessions given to not only you know domestic violence of survivors but the perpetrators and i feel like that's a very controversial topic when you're talking about like because i feel like a lot of people most people saying people can <laughs> agree that like survivors should be at the center and in transformative justice survivors and what they want to see happen as far as accountability um, happen is, is center of that. But in the day, if we're going to have people in our community still that cause harm, we can't just throw them away in the prison or jail or like yes, it's and be like, okay, guys, okay, this is a problem. Because if they have to come back out of the community, you know what I mean? Like, every week we think about policing, it's just like, the policing are, the police are coming after the crime has happened. So what can we do to prevent the crime from happening? And okay. also in some and, and also in some situations, police are not, it's not their job to help mm -hmm. folks that are experiencing homelessness or people that are having issues. Sometimes they exacerbate the problem. And you know, Sometimes so it's just like what can we do? Most of the time. Yes. <laughs> I want it to be not nice and not be so because people think I'm so like radical not to have an issue with that but you know I'm gonna oh. let you say it but yeah okay well, uh, yeah I picked up on that <laughs> but I, I caught it okay. <laughs> thank you um <laughs> you know with, with that and and I guess maybe I'm an old-fashioned person with old-fashioned views because I do believe that we have to look backwards to understand where we're going on how to move forward mm -hmm. and so before like say for instance when you know when you had um during the 60s era and you had communities that were organizing to build power within their communities. It was like a community lookout. It was a community efforts for us mm. to be accountable to one another for one another. And so, um, like, I'll give you an example. Like, I'm, I'm pretty, the, the kids around here, in the neighbor, even the community, in the neighborhood around me, they know who I am. And so, like, say, for instance, if they're outside, if they're standing in front of my house and they're fighting and they're fussing and they're cussing, then I'm going to come outside and I'm going to put an end to that. Um, but I also like, you know, I do things also to, to help them to, to, I, I guess you could say I give them incentives to learn <laughs> instead of just saying I bribe them with candy. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. when they come around and, and they're doing like they, they're exhibiting negative behavior, I try to redirect that, that, that behavior and say like, Hey, you know, you know, if they tell me like, you know, I need a dollar for, for some ice cream. I'm like, okay, well read, read this chapter of this book. You know, or if they say like, I, I want, you know, I want to go to the candy store. Okay, well here, read this book and I'll give you some candy. Um, so it's really more so like for us being accountable, you know, going back to restoring that unity in the, in the community. What can we say like, hey, you know, I see such and such. I see you're struggling with it. How can I help? Or, you know, or even being responsible because, you know, we have, we had gotten to a point to where we didn't want to really tell what was going on in our community. Mm. And so if we, don't, if we don't share that with one another, then we're sharing it with outside agencies. And that allows our communities to be over police. Mm. So when we put, when we take the power back and put it in our hands to say like, hey, this is what the problem is. How do we bring forth the solution? There's a, a, there's a saying in this movement that says, 
the, the, those who are, who are closest to the problem are also closest to the solution. Mm. So and at the same time, those people are also the farthest from the resources. So when we talk about, when we talk about defunding the police and going into, you know, and, and investing into different services that are often criminalized, you know, whether it's homelessness, whether it's, whether it's mental health, these are, you know, things that are criminalized, but put the resources in community led organizations. So say, for instance, if you have, there's a, okay, I heard you speak on, um, on different practices in Chicago and other places. So there's this one practice, so it's not, it's a, it's actually a movement. And it's it's called the Credible Messenger, and it's and it's in in many large cities, New York, Chicago, New Jersey. But what it is 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 it is um the concept of of healed people heal people. So therefore, you take people who are hurting, and you take them on a journey of healing. And in the process of once I once I come to the to the other side of of my my journey, because healing is an ongoing process. But once I'm able to to say that I found some kind of healing, then I'm able to reach back and give it to you. And so, you know, or, or the next person, which the next person may be an at-risk youth, but that may be that may be the bridge to take to, to remove them from the system, to remove them from the pathway. They sometimes they just need a not sometimes we need more alternatives to incarceration. We need to be investing in people over prisons. You know, it's really important for us to understand that you know that people who are justice involved. They are not a different breed of people. They're just, you know, mm -hmm. everyday people. People, everybody makes mistakes. So exactly. that's, that's where redemption comes in. When you can believe that that people are are bigger than their than their worst mistake, then we can we can begin to transform the justice system. And and there's one more thing that I want to I want to say to you to speak to your point about about the hurting. Um, something that I've heard before and that I and I truly believe is that hurt people hurt people. So therefore, when you have batterers who are abusing women, you know, there's no justification, but you also like when you approach this work with a trauma informed lens, then you're trying to dig beneath the actual problem to find out what is the root of the problem? Was this person abused? Why is that? Why has this person become the abuser? So then therefore, you know, when that person, when you address the harm that that person has went through, then you're transforming the justice system. So I definitely think that batterers, that it's really important to, to also address the healing for batterers also. No, that's, no, that's really important. Um, I kind of, before I move on to a different point, I want to kind of circle back around generational trauma and kind of, you kind of touched on this briefly, but yeah, in the black community, um, actually there's, 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 there's this experience that happened to me as a child that like really stood out to me that was really uh, interesting. Um, I remember watching the movie, The Color Purple, um, mm -hmm. They must have been nine or 10 years old. And it was a very interesting movie. Uh, you know, I'm definitely a fan of Alice Walker now and everything like that. But I remember uh, at my grandmother's house, since she had an issue, she used to collect all the Ebony magazines, all the jet yeah, magazines. My um, aunt did too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I would just go look through and just like, oh, you know, I'm in Oklahoma. So I was always, always, I always like, even as a young child, wanted to travel and go other places and was always interested in other people's lives and how they live their lives just out of curiosity. Um, but they profiled the movie, and there was a lot of blowback in the black community about, um, you know, in the movie, because honestly, from what I could gather, a lot of folks in the community were not happy with Alice Walker depicting um, the black men in the book and in the film abusing black women. But I mean, that was the reality of the situation. That's the reality of the situation now, you know. Um, so when we're talking about like folks are out here trying to do this work and, and, and trying to do the best they can, that is commendable. But at the same time, um, if you're not able to have genuine, honest conversations in the community around extremely harmful, harmful practices in the community that will ultimately be the demise of the community, then that puts us in a very, in a very bad place. Um, when I think about my father and my, and my uncles and how they grew up, I mean, they grew up with some very extreme physical and uh, verbal abuse. Um, my uncle, you know, was in and out of prison most of my life. Um, he's a sweet man, love him to death, but, you know, him, my dad, and, you know, even my mother, to a certain extent, you know, the generational trauma is real. And, you know, um, you know, that obviously gets passed down to me and my siblings, you know, um, when it goes unresolved. And then that then affects how we show up in our, you know, relationships, friendships, and things like that. So 
you know, ultimately, um, you know, and it's not easy work, you know, we're not, we're not waving a transformative justice wand and like, woo, society, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I mean, this is long term work. It's hard work. You know what I mean? It's work yeah. that causes you to pull your sleeves up and say, like, yes. okay, yes. like, what do, how do, what do I need to do? Let me roll my sleeves up because yes. this work is dirty. Um, as yep. we talk about, you know, so speaking on, on generational trauma, so my, myself, I am formerly incarcerated. My father, I never had a father, well, until I was in my 30s. But my father was in and out of prison. And and his siblings, he had a brother that was in and out of prison or in and out of jail. But that's on my father's side. But even on my mother's side, my mother's sister has gone to prison. My mother's father has gone to prison. So this has been, you know, this is like an accepted norm that, you know, at, at some point in time, you know, like my cousins have been to prison. So it's like, you know, at some point in time, it's just like accepted that this is a part of life. And so um, that's why I do all that I can to try to stop the generational c- uh, curse. But, you know, in, in having these conversations, you know, because 80% of, not even 80, is, is, is actually higher. It's, it's like 90% of women who are in prison are also, they have, they have experienced some type of, of violence against them. And so these are, so women are sitting in prison with unaddressed trauma. Mm-hmm. So therefore the unaddressed trauma that, you know, that cause it shows up in different ways. It shows up as, as substance abuse. It shows up as mental, mental health disorders. And oftentimes in the black and brown communities, mental health is, is, is stigmatized. So, the, and then, and there's also limited access. If you know, if you are low income and you don't know how to tap into those resources, then you go around suffering from a mental illness that's untreated. And so, and and with that, then it's hard to find stability in your life if you have untreated mental health health issues. So whether that's, you know, um, becoming, you know, being unemployed, whether that's having housing instability, you know, when you're, when your mental is off, then it's hard for everything else to be on track. And as we talk about trauma, uh, there's a depiction that, that I had um, heard one time that, that stays in my mind. And that's of looking at, at people, looking at, you know, especially at, at, at women. We're looking at us like onions. Mm. Because, you know, an onion, the onion, the smell of it will make you cry. And so when you think about women in unaddressed trauma, there's, you know, each, each trauma that we take on adds another level. So then that's another level to bring back or to pull back. So say, for instance, if you started enduring trauma as a child and it goes on into adulthood, um, once again, I'll give myself an, as an example. My mother was, was verbally and physically abusive. So, you know, that's one set of trauma that I had. And then I was molested. That was an additional set of trauma. So these are things that I held in and I, and I, never, and I never told anybody about. So by me not telling anybody about them, then I acted out in a very, very irrational way. I started, you know, I started skipping school. I started, you know, I was just very angry. And oftentimes, um, our young black girls are criminalized even more so because we're perceived to just, you know, have a behavior, di- a behavior dysfunction. And, yeah. and so instead of yeah. saying like, you know, what is the, what is the actual problem? What is the root of the problem? Then instead it's criminalized. And then there begins the pathway to prison. So um, unaddressed trauma, I would definitely say is at, at is a, at a, a, is a court issue of, of incarceration. And, um, and it's really truly hard to understand these issues if you haven't lived it. Yes, you can have empathy. And that's what we need. We need more empathy from everybody just for people to understand that the justice of all people are people first. You know, like not to put a stigma on us just because we've made mistakes. And we're still worthy of dignity. But at the same time, like, you know, listen to us. Elevate our stories and also connect, connect us with resources because we all have a responsibility to make this world a better place. And in making this world a better place, we have to understand our fellow brothers and sisters' struggle. Yes, uh, that's powerful. Oh, uh, <laughs> I'm not a crying person, but that's, uh, that's <laughs> that really gets to me. Um, Thank you. So I kind of want to, you know, dig a little bit further uh, on the layers. Good, good metaphor there you gave us uh, on transformative justice. Um, so something, and I want to take it back to local, something that's interesting to me that I noticed in Tulsa um, when it comes to like accountability and yes, there's, there's this, we all know a little about toxic ne- negativity, right? In relationships, like we've been speaking to that. But something that I've noticed um, is uh, 
toxic positivity where um, people want to be so hopeful and joyful all the time to the point that they blind themselves to real harm that's happening and don't hold people accountable. Because for me, if you have love for someone, but you're not holding them accountable for when they are doing harm and setting boundaries and doing that kind of thing, then you're ultimately calling harm to yourself and they're not growing as a person and you're not growing as a person. So for me, I feel like, you know, there's a way that yes, um, positive relationships and relationship building can still happen, but that doesn't mean that because we are having crucial conversations that that is a negative, that is a positive because mm -hmm. hopefully we're all as, you know, during our time on this earth, we're trying to grow and become better people. Um, so I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Like, do you agree with that or not? Or like, I, just, I was just curious to get your thoughts on that. I think that's a very good point, Samantha. Um, I think it's really important for us to engage in these difficult conversations because if, if you don't have somebody that's around you in your life that's authentic enough to hold you accountable when you are creating harm to, to yourself and to, to, the per, the, your, to the people next to you, um, I think that that can cause more damage. But you also have to have a balance. You've yes, got yes. to, you know, you've got to, you've got to mix pragmatism with, with optimism. Mm -hmm. You know, me, I'm a very hopeful person and I, and I always try to look at the glass as, as being half full. Um, yes. However, like, you know, it, it won't do me any good if I stay in the clouds, you know, like I have to come down some and be like, okay, how can, how can, can we build our relationship? And so, but something I want to ask you, I want to put it back on you. So. As we talk about holding, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. So as we talk about holding one another accountable, where where do you think that it comes in also in, in holding our elected officials accountable when we know that they're doing when we know that they're doing harmful um, practicing harmful behaviors to our community? At what point in time is it more is it more harmful to say to speak up? You know, would we you know and risk damaging the movement? You know, which way which way do you think damages the movement more speaking up or not speaking up dang that's a good question man <laughs> um now i will say as far as what i've seen in tulsa i don't think that there's a shortage of folks that are um holding officials accountable by speaking up i do think though as far as holding officials accountable elected officials there needs to be more of a variety of strategies and apparatuses in place to hold them accountable you know um and we also need to understand that there are political individuals. So like, you know, there are times when you can tell your story and try to appeal to them that way, but we've got to have, you know, a variety of options and strategies um, in our back pocket um, as far as accountability is concerned, you know, and this is where I feel like this talk around transformative justice is so important. I feel like sometimes we get very, um, as people, and it's not an insult, it's just what it is. We get very comfortable in doing what we've always done, even though it's not getting us where we need to be because, you know, the sphere of the unknown. What if this thing over here that we're trying doesn't really work? But it's just like, well, what is the harm of trying something different because of what we're doing is already just, you know, not really getting us there. What is the harm in trying something different, honestly? Um, so I really don't have a direct. <laughs> and, and I don't think it's, I don't think it's there is. I don't think that there is a direct answer. That that's just something I want to get your viewpoint on. Um, yeah, I, I, I did want to follow up before we before we go into the next point. That's a good question. So something, and this is a question back to you, but I did want to follow up with the hope thing. So I don't want to. Yes, I get what you're saying. Like, and this is why I like being around. I, I actually, you know, honestly seek out being around people that are not like me because I don't think I'm a pessimist. I'm a realist, but like sometimes because you know I'm just so cynical. Sometimes it comes off as I'm being negative. But I think you need people like me that can like cut through the bull sometimes and tell you what it is. But then we also need people like you that are gonna like look on the bright side of things, um, like you said. So yes, what one of the main things that keeps me going, um, even though I mean I consider myself an optimist, is hope. Um, and actually, I was just reading a little bit from um, one of my favorite Transformers Justice activists, Miriam Kaba. Um, it was some snippets of an essay she wrote called "Hope Is a Discipline." I'm sorry, um, what was the name of her? Uh, Miriam Kaba. So her name okay. is spelled um, M-A-R-I-A-M-E, and her last name is Kaba, K-A-B-A. -A 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 -A. uh, I, I just couldn't, you broke um, up a little bit, and I couldn't hear you. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah, and I meant to spell that out anyway, because it's not a typical, typical spelling of Miriam. Um, but yeah, she talks about how, like, 
we can still have hope, but still have accountability in there. You know, hope is not naive. Hope is, you know, you know, it, it's, it's something that it's a discipline. We have to work at some hope doesn't mean that we have to be upbeat all the time. Sometimes, you know, we're in a funk and it's okay to, to, to admit that and, and being that emotional state and take some time for ourselves and be like, I'm not feeling it today. I'm, I'm, I'm really down about things. I'm, you know, but as long as we still the thing that keeps me going, even when I have a bad attitude some days or I'm not showing up the way I like to show up is like, that I do have a hope for the future. I'm always looking forward to the future. So that's what keeps me going. That didn't, you know, that's why I don't just like curl up in, no, or some days I do curl up in the ball and you ain't going to hear from me for some days. Okay. But, you know, eventually <laughs> I will come out. <laughs> you have that hope there waiting for me. Yeah. It's just like the hope for a better future. So, but again, it's, you know, it's based in, you know, believing in people, right? You know, mm-hmm. um, and, and appreciating people, you know, as they are. And like, like you said, not judging people by their worst mistake. And, you know, give people that chance to make that mistake and to grow and to get better. Um, and for us all to learn from the transformation of other people, because we all have something to learn, um, not just the folks that, that you know, know, are being the outcasts of society, like the people who are just as involved and, and things of that nature. We all, we all have some growing to do. Everybody is falling I think personally. <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, go ahead. Just speaking to your point of hope for the future, um, when I was doing, when I was incarcerated and I was doing my time, it was hope for the future that, that, that kept me going. It was that hope of coming home and returning to my child and being able to, to build a stable life and that was in a healthy environment for him. That's what kept me going. And that's what also kept me going. Like that's what gave me the vision to come to Tulsa and to build block builders because I knew that I was coming to a city that had been traumatized by the, the 1921 racial massacre. I saw that it, there was a community that was constantly disinvested. So therefore you have mm-hmm. multiple dilapidated buildings and you have a lack of economic development and you have a high incarceration rate. So I knew, you know, coming coming here that it, this was a place that needed that needed a lot of hope. And so um and and I still and and, and that's why that's what motivates me to do what I do, to be able to because block builders, our goal is to build hope block by block. And so that means if it starts out with me building hope on my block by spending time with the children, but not only spending time with the children, but by feeding, um, by, by helping to feed families during this pandemic, yeah. or even mm-hmm. to checking on my elderly neighbors, that, um, that just having hope that we can come together to create a better future. It's, you know, it's, it's definitely hope that, that keeps us going, even during this pandemic. I think hope is an essential part of life. I completely agree. I completely agree. So Lucas, I'm going to bring you back in. I really would like to um, try to get some other folks in on this conversation. So um, if anyone has any questions, uh, comments, anything like that around transformative justice, uh, feel free to, um, Lucas, are we doing like a typing in of the questions? Hey, can you hear me? Okay. Um, Yeah. uh, so, one sec. Um, so just for the chat, uh, if yeah, please, if there's anything you'd like to get to, um, feel free to leave questions. Um, uh, just looking through kind of what we have immediately, um, I'm gonna play moderator briefly and semi moderate this question, but. Um, yeah, uh, can we, when there are specific individuals in our community who are resisting accountability and talking about uh, toxic positivity or, yeah, but who kind of seem, how, how can we address and hold individuals accountable and kind of address that issue? A, 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 a viewpoint on that because as we talk about the toxic positivity we talk about it from an individual standpoint but what about from an organizational standpoint mm. or from an organizations accountable because you have a lot of these organizations who are doing the so-called criminal justice reform work but in actuality they're they're perpetuating the same systems that have, that have constantly oppressed people in in, in mass over incarcerated our communities you know, so the same people that, they, you know, they don't have an understanding, but they, you know, they just do things to make the statistics and the numbers fluctuate, but those numbers are encompassing of the entire story. Those mm-hmm. numbers, like you may have a diversion program that is 
that is geared towards towards white women succeeding, but the the success rate for black women is you know is a small percentage. You know, um, how do you hold organizations accountable like that who have that false that that that, that toxic positivity? You know, they they you know bring forth the the effort. You know, like show the the image that they're doing the work. But in actuality, there's more to unpack under the work. And so, you know, this is what we're talking about when we talk about these organizations who don't understand cause creating more harm. So I want to like want to answer, but I want to kind of touch on that. So to be honest, I think as far as that, you know, from organizational perspective, I don't even think it's toxic positivity on organizational perspective. I think that's more unpacking the nonprofit industrial complex, which we could, that could be a whole nother chat yeah. for sure. Um, and talking about like going back to, and another thing that's kept us from engaging with one another as a community is that, you know, just in, in the age of capitalism, just saying that bashing capitalism, but like a hallmark of capitalism is the, is, 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 <laughs> is, is the individual, me, 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 all the time. And how am I doing? How am I? So like, you know, when it comes to nonprofit industrial complex, you know, um, and this whole thing around like charity and not giving people agency and dignity in the assistance that you're giving them. And like, you know, we talk about mutual aid or talking about community led, like uh, violence disruptor programs. That's, it's really that simple where it's just like, you have some folks that are ultimately, when you see folks that are working from this nonprofit industrial complex lens, they're centering themselves. They're saying that they're trying to help other people, but ultimately you're centering yourself. You know, if you did not have the prestige and the pictures and the awards and the galas to celebrate the work, would you be doing the work? Is what I would ask, and I feel like a lot of folks, a lot of folks cannot cannot answer that honestly and say yes. So I, I think ultimately it has to become where it's just like we need to, and those folks included, start from here. How are your relationships looking? Are you holding for white individuals that are in these institutions? Are you holding your actual friends and family members who have problematic views and biases accountable instead of just trying to do these programs here, here, and there? But it's just ultimately. And I feel like in Tulsa, we miss the nuances of racism. It's like either like you're a neo-Nazi and you're a skinhead and you're out here just with all these racial and homophobic slurs or you're a total good guy. And it's like there are completely different shades of gray to this white supremacy thing. You know what I mean? There's a lot of folks that probably think they're doing the work, but it's just like the fact that you're coming in like you're a knight in shining armor into the community. That's inherently racist, in my opinion. You don't have to yeah. be like, you know, our boogeyman image of, you know, the, the racist that, you know, that's in pop culture to be a racist or to be, perpetuate racist ideologies or that kind of thing. So, yeah. So yeah, that went and, way off left, but. <laughs> and, it, and it's okay because I want to I wanna speak to your point, though, as we talk about, about what racism looks like, you know, like how it's not one extreme or the other. Because, mm -hmm. you know, something to keep in mind that this silence is compliance. You know, like I have, you know, I have, I have, you know, I have people who I've worked with who I, you know, I adore, but when it comes to speaking of issues of race, then they're silent on them. So yeah. how, how much, how much work are you doing if you're actually silent? And, you know, and, and going back to talking about the nonprofit, the, the exploitation, you know, the non, the, was it the nonprofit industrial complex? Yes. Um, you know, when we talk about capitalism, it's, you know, to exploit our, our pain. So a lot of times you mm. have these nonprofit industries who they come in and they and they monetize on our community's pain, and therefore they say that they're bringing forth these solutions, but the solutions are they are more harmful to us. But you have to also keep in mind, or you know, if there is a solution created, then that you know would that jeopardize their job security. So do they therefore do they really want the communities to find solutions? Mm, I agree. I agree. Well, sorry, Lucas, I'll let you, <laughs> are there any other questions? But I love, I, I love that went. That was great. <laughs> um, any other questions? I mean, I, I'm not sure we totally got to that uh, answer, but um, I did like where that okay, went. Okay, well, <laughs> so I mean, so, so, so get to the answer? So, I mean, it was a very broad question. So, I mean, can you like, like can you like, I, again, I'm like, <laughs> okay, this person's asking, I, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, before we say a question, this person's question you got to give me, I want to kind of, I guess I, I want to try to kind of answer your question. 
So basically what I would say is for folks that are trying to say, well, they're trying to poke in the holes. Well, what about this? What about this? What about that? And I understand you're playing devil's advocate which, and I appreciate that, but I would turn back around and say, what is the current system for you? What's the current system doing for you right now? I mean, the majority of sexual assaults go unreported right now. And when women go and try to report it, they report getting a lot of hostility from police officers and almost like, you know, their entire sexual history is, is, is like game to be picked through when that shouldn't be the case. When you talk about, you know, gang violence, the, the, the cops are not trying to solve, you know, deaths of black men and black women in the community. So when people are saying, well, they're, they're operating off the false premise that the system we have right now is working as is. So why are we going to something new? That's a false premise to operate off of so for me i would turn it back around and be like you know what are the systems we have in place doing for you right now they're not they're not they're not delivering for the community they're not transforming anyone's lives they're destroying lives they're destroying families so that would be my answer ultimately on that i mean i know it's not an answer but this, this is no it's not like demario is saying this whole thing the form of justice is long-term work you know what i mean it's not gonna be the easy victories the easy wins the cute like you know, the media ain't gonna be coming here taking snapshot interviewing us about this stuff. You know, it's gonna be like the private thankless work, but it needs to be done if we're really trying to liberate people and trying to free people and trying to see people have their lives be transformed and, and see the lives of the whole community be transformed. So that's what um, I say. To just hop in. Okay, so I, I'm not gonna censor this question, um, although I don't just, want us to become the venue for debating this, but uh, someone's asking just specifically about Rico Wright. And, uh, you know, I think that, I don't think we have to get into that, but just like, I think broadly in. Um, I think that's a touchy subject to touch on due to the fact that that is an individual that the community knows. Um, so me personally, I do not feel comfortable sharing my personal viewpoint. Um, that's where I'm like, can we talk about this not as about a specific person, but can we talk mm -hmm. about it yeah, as in a broad context? Yes. Yes. So definitely, definitely, definitely so. In a broad context, um, I think it's important for people to be held responsible held accountable for their actions, um, to listen to the stories of the, the victims and also um to create that space for the victim story to be heard but not to discount the, the, you know, or to, to um, make excuses that, that, that stand in the way of accepting responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I think it's, like I guess I think it's important for us to, to hold individuals accountable. Um, I mean, at the same time, like we don't know, we don't know all the details. Um, I don't know, like that's really, that's a, that's a touchy, that's a touchy subject, Samantha. I guess, I, and, I, and I agree with you speaking to it more broadly, I guess I'd like to, um, Lucas, could you like tell us the question sans the personal connection? Like, <laughs> is there any way to like get to the, the crux of what the question is without? I think that's, that's kind of what I was trying to do. Or, like <laughs> when we have like not talking about people necessarily uh, embody, you know, in the criminal justice system or we're not talking about police specifically, we're talking about an individual in our community, and I can think of, you know, in the arts in Tulsa, I can, you know, I have a person who is not this other person, but, you know, is doing a lot of damage and harm and yeah. should be held accountable. And um, what, how, like, how through transformative justice, you know, not resorting to vengeance, not resorting to canceling or whatever, you know, what is the more positive mode of Okay. Um, I, so I get what you, I get what you're saying a little bit um, a little bit better now, Lucas. Um, with with that, on, you know, on on holding that individual accountable because it's very important for them to still accept accountability or to acknowledge their wrongs. Um, so, say for instance, from a victim standpoint and looking at it in, through the lens of restorative justice, then that's where a space is created for that victim to be able to share their story, um, to be able to face their accuser. And, and also for the accuser to, to listen to, you know, to listen to how that the victim was impacted um, in, in order to be able to start addressing the harm. And in another step though, like, you know, going back to that concept of hurt people hurt people, um, of, of getting getting to the actual root cause of like, you know, hey, so what pain are you walking in? 
that's caused you to act out and show up in that way to where you can violate somebody else's boundaries without even considering the damage that's doing to that person. Um, so it's different. I think there's different ways of looking at it from a victim standpoint, but also the, 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 um, the perpetrator standpoint too. I hope I answered your question a little bit. I think you did. I think you did a beautiful job answering that very awkward question. I think you did. Yes, and I apologize. Um, I just. I, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> hey, it's, we try. <laughs> answered a very classy, very classy way. I appreciate that. And I and, I, and I'm, not, I'm not just not. I'm I'm just not. The reason I'm not answering is because I feel like she did a thorough job answering. Not because I'm not answering for other reasons, but like you did a fantastic job answering. So yeah. Um, uh, I think maybe just there. There was one person who really responded to the peace circle. I think you're talking about, and maybe this is a whole nother panel to have, but talking about like uh, transformative justice from indigenous perspective and like how there are, yeah, existing modes for doing this and we're not inventing the wheel. Um, it, it, it is also a concept, because like when we talk about indigenous people, you also have to think of the, the Yoruba concept. Um, it's, the, it's the concept of Ubuntu. And it's I am because, of, because you are. You know, that we exist together, that I'm better because of you. And so therefore, when, when I have done something that damages the community, then you all encircle around me and lift me up to help me walk in the better version of myself. That this is what I see in you. This is who I see you to be. This is what I expect from you. So therefore, you're lifting me up instead of putting me down. Um, that's a, a Yoruba concept, also. Sorry, I'm muting and unmuting myself. Um, uh, I think maybe could we just close talking a bit about. Uh, Samantha, what you've got cooking at Tulsa Star and what Block, <laughs> what Block Builders is up to um, and, and how, we, how we can support the two of you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for this conversation. It was really wonderful. And thanks so much for sharing these stories. Um, yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll let I'll let Miss Monday speak first about what she's got brewing over at Block Builders. A lot of amazing work going on over there. So, Thank you. Um, at the moment, Block Builders, we have been addressing the need, the community's needs during the pandemic by we've been providing a home cooked meal every Wednesday at Vernon AME. And we feed the community, but more specifically, people who are experiencing homelessness. And so like say for instance, yesterday we had chicken parmesan and spaghetti with, with um with toasted garlic bread. So you know, we we you know, we feed good home cooked meals that we want people to get full from. And we're in and the purpose of us feeding these meals to the community is to also build hope. This is saying that no matter where we are in this time, that that's how we can get back to building unity in the community is by, you know, building hope with one another. Um, something else that we do is that we provide hygiene products. We provide hygiene to, um, whether it's feminine hygiene products, whether it's, um, you know, in addition to, as Vernon passes out food, but we pass out hand sanitizer and masks. You know, just to, you know, start addressing people's basic needs and meeting people where they're at, that, you know, it, just showing people that um, everybody is somebody, that it doesn't matter where you are in life, that you, you know, that we still believe that you're capable of being a better person and in situations and, and circumstances can get better. And so with that, um, that's one of the things that we've been doing. And so if you, if anybody would like to, to join, to join that cause and helping us to build that and further the cause, you can find us on, on Facebook at Block Builders, and that's Block Builders with a Z at the end. And you can also email me at blockbuilders100 at gmail.com. Beautiful. Yeah, I see you, Samantha. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's on the spot. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so, you know, Tulsa Star was down for a couple of months. We relaunched. Um, I forgot because it was a couple weeks ago, a week and a half ago, a couple weeks ago. So basically we're just, you know, continuing to do, you know, our truth telling through investigative journalism. We're going to continue to do our accountability piece as far as transformative justice is concerned, holding those institutions of power accountable um, to, you know, 
you know, um, their role in pushing for better Tulsa, you know, that's the role that they're tasked with. So we want to make sure that we're continuing to ask those uh, hard questions and make sure that people have the information they need to make decisions that they need to uh, for, for their communities. Um, and just kind of continuing to do that, you know, we're going to expand, you know, we're going to, by expand, I mean like, um, expanding as far as like the content we're covering, but it's, it's still always going to be the same truth-centered investigative journalism that you can expect from us. Um, of course, we're going to expand into the videos soon. So I'm just really excited, you know, got a new staff writer. He's amazing. Um, got a lot of great content coming out very soon, like next week. So um, I'm sure that will, you know, <laughs> that will bring up some more great, you know, much needed conversations. So you know, I'm in it. I'm in it to have these these uh, difficult conversations, um, whether it's as a community or personally. You know, again, this is hard work, but if we're all in it for the ultimate goal of of, of liberating ourselves, um, then it has to be done. It definitely has to be done. And you know, um, as far as where people can help us out, you know, I've seen some folks say donate to us, but don't donate to me. <laughs> I don't have the infrastructure for that. But, you know, always looking to have, you know, additional hands on deck with writing, of course. So if you, you know, you like to write um, and, you know, you know, you're into the cause, you know, of what we do um, as far as true telling in written form, then, you know, feel free to reach out, newtulsastar at gmail.com. Please, you know, follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, follow what we're doing. We'll continue to have, you know, events like this, partnering with great um, groundbreaking, innovative organizations in Tulsa that are really trying to do the real work, really trying to center community, um, not centering themselves, no shade, um, but are really trying to, we're trying to build people up, y'all. So we, you know, this is collaborative effort. So I'm willing to work with anyone, whoever is on that same page you know, to get that, get us to that finish line, so. Thank you so much. Um, all right, signing off. Uh, thanks, Trish. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thanks.